Uh, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so my name is Mike Shaver um, and I'm director of Sustainable Futures. So S Sustainable Futures is our uh, overarching sustainability platform covering lots and lots of different things. I'm just going to start by going through some housekeeping stuff and then introduce you to our platform and then turn uh, the floor over to someone to talk about some combative stuff. Uh, hopefully of interest to everybody today. Uh, so uh, right now we're in welcome and introductions. Um, you can see where we're going to go. What uh, I'd like to remind you of is, is we have this really interesting methodology here where we're actually going to have questions after you guys have a chance to talk about this stuff. One of the things we find in sustainability is that interdisciplinarity is really important. And so we want to give you space to actually talk to people who you might not have met before, who might have a different perception of you to help think about what Mark is going to be saying, what some of those concepts are and how they might influence you to help frame what the questions are. So we're going to have his talk, uh, have a networking lunch, and then come back with a panel uh, to talk about those things. And, and that's the moment where you're really going to have a chance to, to ask questions. So use that lunch uh, accordingly, please. Um, at, just for uh, housekeeping, uh, so there's no fire alarm planned today. So if uh, there is a alarm, uh, we will all be really disappointed. Uh, effectively, where we're going to head, so we're in number one right here. Uh, we're coming across to the assembly point up there in terms of where we're going. Um, and then uh, there's a map there in terms of telling you uh, where toilets are. But if you get lost, uh, just head out and uh, ask any of the uh, Sustainable Futures team uh, to let you know where to go. Uh, we are taking videos uh, of me right now. Hello. Uh, uh, but there will be sort of photo, photos and videos today. So if you don't want your photo or video taken, uh, just talk to Emily, who's in the back there, and she can make sure we scrub your face from the world. Um, so uh, probably the, the question that was asked most frequently to me uh, outside uh, this room is, is why in the world uh, we have called this the Albatross Lectures. This is the first Albatross Lecture. Uh, and when we were thinking about what we wanted to call it, well, we wanted to have something which was really uh, kind of tethered the complexity of sustainability together. And this lecture series is then named after something which actually really covers so many different uh, environmental challenges that we face. So the Albatross is, is one of the largest birds it's also very threatened, so it's it's nearing extinction. Uh, it uh, has featured in lots of different uh, media discourses, from Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner to to writings today, uh, and it tethers to each one of our different challenge areas in terms of the things that we are trying to do to make the world a more sustainable place. Um, so the, Emily, again at the back, uh, did a really cool video uh, that kind of talks about that, and you can see it playing on the screens uh, outside. So what is Sustainable Futures? Um, well, Sustainable Futures was established as a research platform two years ago uh, at the university. And really this is uh, a mechanism to sort of tackle the complexity and the unintended consequences of sustainability. So when we think about that, we're often thinking about technology changing, right? Oh, we're gonna have solar energy and all our problems will be solved. But in fact, what we have in sustainability is a lot of interrelationships and dependencies and unintended consequences on all of those sustainable changes. And we wanted to have a community-based approach and a disciplinary approach, uh, which could really tackle those challenges. The words we use uh, in terms of uh, things that we want to do. So we want to be able to elevate uh, the importance of environmental sustainability, but also the interrelationship with social and economic sustainability at the university. And that means we really need to bring people together and start singing in harmony, which doesn't mean we're all singing the same note. It means we're singing in harmony. Uh, we want to be able to connect. Uh, we are uh, one of the largest universities uh, in Europe. And I joined here five years ago and still am meeting people who I've never seen before. Uh, and so we really need to be able to understand our capabilities and map that across, especially when we need to bring new perspectives to bear on some of those challenges. We need to recognize a lot of the things we're doing uh, are, are already really good, right? And so we need to have mechanisms to celebrate those uh, uh, excellent uh, opportunities that we have to do uh, good work. Uh, and then we want to be able to grow those things, especially in those interdisciplinary spaces. Uh, to do this, we're uh, organized around six different challenge areas. So those are called resourceful futures, inspired and informed futures, net zero futures, 
healthy futures, inclusive and prosperous futures, and resilient futures. And you can think of these as lenses through which we look at those environmental sustainability challenges. Uh, I am the director, but uh, I really am uh, driven to do this job by having an excellent team around me. Uh, so a lot of those people are here today, and you can meet them uh, at the lunch break or afterwards. Uh, but our deputy director is Helen. She'll be on the panel later. Uh, Veronica sort of leads our, our operations and strategy and engagement. Um, and then each one of our challenges uh, has an academic lead that really champions those areas. What's really interesting about this is that these areas are not in isolation. And some of the most interesting spaces are where there are contestations across these uh, different research challenge areas. So if you think about some sort of a net zero change, right, we're going to go and switch to hydrogen uh, as an energy source. Well, that actually might have an influence on the inclusivity and prosperity of certain communities. And we need to be able to understand the changes, but also the contextualization of how those fit across each other. Um, so uh, where are we up to now? So in two years, we're about 1,500 people strong. Um, but more importantly, I think we have probably the best understanding of our uh, environmental sustainability expertise. Uh, so we can really quickly uh, bring a community together to go and address some sort of a challenge. Um, and uh, a lot of those challenges have uh, involved working with external stakeholders, so industry, policymakers, um, uh, the institutes, which are really uh, important to us and, and more. Um, a lot of our focus areas have been on, on those applied spaces, so circular economy, sustainable manufacturing, energy transition, but also stretching into where climate is influencing a lot of other areas, so local policy, climate and health, retrofit, and more complex issues. Um, uh, and of course, this isn't just about us doing the research. It's also a, about us communicating. And so where there are those opportunities to think about the skills that we need for future generations is really important. And we call those primers and masterclasses. So the things that everybody really needs to know a little bit about and the things that we want people to be uh, more expert in uh, if they're interested. Uh, just the signpost, uh, if this is your first uh, Sustainable Futures event, uh, we have lots of events. This is our flagship. Uh, flagship, Mark, that's good. Yeah, good. Um, uh, but we have other things that are coming on that uh, are perhaps a little bit more specific. Uh, and you see this list there. Uh, so starting on the 8th of February, uh, which is looking at GIS, 21st of February, uh, sustainability in construction. Uh, this particular has a focus on external stakeholders. Uh, 23rd of February on uh, creativity and qualitative methods. Uh, and then the 29th of February is uh, the next iteration of our uh, regular seminar series. So if you're actually a University of Manchester academic and you want to talk at a future one of those and showcase your bit of environmental sustainability, then please reach out to us uh, and we can add you to the schedule. Um, and really, that's uh, it for me in terms of uh, giving you a primer on, on environmental sustainability research at the University of Manchester. And please do connect with our teams because we always have lots of stuff going on. Um, so I'm going to stop talking about us and start talking about Mark instead. Uh, so I've known Mark for a few years, um, but I have uh, printed out. We were talking last night uh, about how we were both getting old, and I've had to print this out in the largest font size that I've ever had to print this out before. So um, probably you can all eventually read this from the front of the, the screen, but we'll go with this for now. Uh, so uh, Mark is a professor at UCL. Um, uh, he's professor of materials and society, which I think is one of the better professor names uh, that's out there. Uh, but he's evolved into materials and society as a person from quite an applied background. So he originally did his PhD at Oxford uh, in turbine jet engine alloys, uh, which seems deadly specific, um, but has really worked uh, to diversify that, that knowledge uh, across lots of different roles in the USA, Ireland, and the UK. Uh, I would say champion materials and interdisciplinarity. Um, and this interdisciplinarity stretches across humanities, medicine, design, society, uh, and now I think a particular focus on sustainability. Uh, so he, from that lens, uh, established what's called the UCL Institute of Making. Um, and so is director of that still and, and runs their research program. Um, he has set up what's called the Plastic Waste Innovation Hub, which is one of the flagship plastic waste innovation uh, communities within the United Kingdom, looking at the complexity, I think, of those environmental challenges um, across 
biodegradation, reuse, repair. I'm sure he'll talk about some of those things. Uh, he also, uh, so I first uh, read his last name when people started applying to university because everybody's like, I'm going and studying material science because I read Mark Miodovnik's book. And I was like, well, I don't know how to pronounce that last name. And now I do. Um, uh, so he, he wrote a New York Times bestselling book, which is called Stuff Matters, which is a fascinating read. Definitely recommend it. Uh, it's currently on sale on Amazon, as uh, so you can buy it. Um, uh, if you have a copy with you, Mark will sign it at the break. Um, I'm, I'm promising things you might not do. So, uh, a regular presents on, on BBC. So not only is talking, uh, about materials to the expert communities, but also to the general public. And I think that's really important that we showcase the importance of materials to the general world. Uh, in 2014, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. In 2018, he was awarded an MBE for services to material science, engineering, and broadcasting, uh, and continues to be someone who I really look up to and model myself after. Uh, so, Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mike. Uh, that's yeah. Well, it's too kind. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I I'm so um, yeah delighted to be here and to be invited to talk to you all, to be amongst friends. And thanks, Mike, for those kind words. That's really yes, <laughs> um, really appreciated. Um, yes. So, um, what do I want to talk about? Um, I um, yeah. I, I, I when I was invited to give this talk, I um was in that it was in a mindset where I've been just finishing a research project about recycling and 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 um and and dealing with waste and I was you know you know like a lot of us kind of thinking god it's a huge weight of this this waste mountain that keeps building up if only people would just stop doing it so much like creating waste and so I, I you can tell that the the kind of mindset I was in where I came up with this title which is like okay so is consumerism and the way in which we make products and then don't really think about what's going to happen to them is that is that has that got legs you know is that commensurable with sustainability our future that that was the question i wanted to talk to you all about and and, and this talk really is a discussion so you know i'm, I'm going to give you a i'm going to do, give a defense of consumerism and then i'm going to kind of i think paint a picture of why i think it can't last in its current form for lots of reasons, and then put it out to you whether we want to save consumerism and and, there, and how we might do that, or that we don't want to save consumerism, whether it's done its thing now and we need to move on to something else. So that's basically the arc of the talk. Oh, yeah, I know it. I know it. <laughs> Sorry, I changed the name. Yeah. It's sort of more emotional, isn't it? And, and, and partly because I think when I looked up the rhyme of the ancient mariner, um, and I, I was looking at the kind of descriptions and, and, the, and the etchings. This is Gustave Doré's etching of that rhyme. It's a very famous um, Coleridge poem uh, from the turn of the uh, 18th century um, about um, a mariner who comes back from a long voyage and um, talks to someone who's going to a wedding and, and says to him, stay, stay a while. I want to just tell you something. And, and, and the guy sort of entertains him as you kind of do when someone kind of strange kind of grabs your arm and then he recounts this tale of, of going on this voyage and and he killing an albatross and how it the misfortune that happened to him and the whole of the ship and it's all told in this rhyme of the ancient mariner and if you haven't read it i really recommend you do because it kind of is about the perils of us endangering the environment and whether we and what what will befall us you know it's it's it's, it's a tale of of woe and of of to, for us to beware. So that's why I sort of, I've, I've kind of thought about, you know, are we heading towards, are we heading towards um, a, a place where, where we, you know, are going to not be able to survive from this planet? I don't want to kind of go too much. Um, I'm, I'm going to split it into, th into three parts, part one, part two, and part three. The first part is just introducing materials because I, I know this audience is, is from a wide variety of backgrounds and I don't want to kind of just get straight into materials as if and the technicalities of them all without kind of giving everyone a primer um, and then go into this thing called the circular economy which I hope all of you know about but again talk about that's kind of the the big the big future perhaps for us that might um, come into play and and seems essentially the kind of in pole position for a, a switch in the way in which we handle our economy and materials in particular and then talk about systems analysis and then we'll 
after lunch discuss it all and you can critique where I went wrong and perhaps where I had a point. Okay, so um, this is just a picture outside my old lab and just to kind of say that uh, I used to wait for the bus here and I used to think about all the different materials I could see while waiting for the bus. This is before smartphones, before I, while, while we were all still looking around when we were waiting for things. Um, and of course, the thing you quite quickly realize is that, you know, there are just so many materials in our environment. I mean, this, this room is another example of that. And you're sitting on them, and and it's so complex. And 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 what what does it mean that we made so many different materials? Where do they come from, and and why 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 do we make all these? And and essentially, well, that that the story of this is is kind of summarized in in the book that Mike was talking about. Stuff matters. But basically, my my kind of argument is that these are all expressions of our values. Like we made these materials. And the ages of civilization are named after materials. So you have the Stone Age, the Copper Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. Every time we we want to change who we are as, as a kind of expression of humanity, we invent a material and you get an age, a change. So, you know, the silicon comes along and we have the information age, um, plastics come along. So we, we change how we live and who we are. These are expressions of us, like what we want. We don't want toothache, so we invent amalgams, right? You know, we, we, we don't want the wind to blow through all our buildings. We invent glass and the window. So, you know, really, you know, all of this is how we want to live. And, 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 and that tells you something about who we are. And, of course, without this, take all this away, and we're naked, shivering in the mud, especially here. And, um, and of course, we wouldn't be able to survive. So we, we, we and materials, the, these are us, and they are us, um, and, and we are them. Um, and, and the thing is, you know, when we get to the 20th century, and I mean, I, I, you know, the materials and our ability to make them suddenly become, you know, you know, we we suddenly are able to do marvelous, marvelous things. So you you get the invention of the motor car as a, as an amalgam of lots of different material inventions. There's the rubberized pneumatic tires and and the and the steel and a mass produced you know assembly and the and the internal combustion engine and and this is a really big change in what people can do and and what the horizons are like they have personal mobility um and in in the home you know you're coming from a period where people didn't have very much literally most people's homes are not full of lots of things wooden furniture some pot, pots and pans um some cutlery uh, a few bits and bobs here and there but suddenly 20th century really rolls out mass production in fact is what really happens we start not just make materials but we can make objects with them and, and make them so efficiently in factories that they're cheap everyone can have one everyone can have a car everyone can have a radio um everyone can have a washing machine this is also also part of liberating women and you know who, who did the majority of the washing probably still do the majority of the washing actually if we're honest with ourselves but you know these machines start to make really tangible differences to all sorts of ways in which society works. But most importantly, you know, the, the, those, those people who are in receipt of these goods and able to afford them become materially very rich. Um, and then suddenly, weirdly, what happens is that, whereas before we really valued these materials and we really, you know, a washing machine coming to the house or a radio or a car was worshiped and, and loved and made to last, you know, as long as you could possibly make it to last, suddenly a whole set of people realize that because mass production is so cheap, actually, you can just give people stuff that is meant to be disposable. And, and, and one of the first ones is the, is the razor. So before this, if you want to shave, you have a, a razor that is reusable, and you have to sharpen it, and you have to know how to do that, or you go to the barber who knows how to do that. And then you get... Um, King Camp Gillette, and he says, look, no, don't worry about it. Just make you a bit of steel, and you can shave, and then after four or five of those, just throw it away. And disposability isn't just about sort of this profligacy of materials and this kind of, this, this kind of luxurious being able to kind of say, look, we've got so much wealth now, we don't have to worry about it. It's also about health. So the, 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 you know, we had these fountains in all, all the major cities, and people shared cups, and they were chained. And people got very worried about, you know, health of that, people communicating diseases to each other. So there was big campaigns against getting rid of shared cups and reusable cups. And, and disposable cups are pushed onto the market in order to, to, to kind of address an issue there. Um, 
And then you have this. This is from Alfred P. Sloan, Jr., 1924. And it's a really important statement about disposability, and it's important in the economy. Some have the idea that the reason in this country we discard things so readily, and this is America, by the way, is because we have so much. The facts are exactly the opposite. The reason we have so much is simply because we discard things so re readily. We replace the old in return for something that will serve us better. And this is the beginning of consumerism as an economic model and as a mode of driving the economy. And quite quickly, everyone gets the hang of it. So they, on purposely and without any shame, change the livery on their cars every year. Anyone rich enough to be able to afford the newest model is able then to show their wealth and their success in the world through the fact they got the latest model. That then drives a lot of jobs in the automobile industry. It then means that there's loads of cars that are kind of having to be destroyed at the end of life so that it can keep um, it can keep uh, the desire for new going. So there isn't a, there isn't a focus on keeping things going uh, and, re and repairing the old. There's actually a focus on exactly the opposite. And this is all encapsulated in a brilliant film, uh, which is in a sort of 1950s Ealing comedy with um, Alec Guinness at the start. If you haven't seen this, I really recommend it because it's, it's, so, it's so kind of contemporary now. It's about a scientist, could be Mike, could be me, could be any of you perhaps, who invents in, in, the, in, the, in the search for sustainability and wealth, he invents a material that can't be broken, it's a, it's a fabric, and it can't be stained either. So it'll never, you never need cleaning. And he thinks that everyone is gonna just absolutely fall over and just worship him. He's just solved a major problem, which is that we only have to have a few sets of clothes for your whole life and you never have to buy a new one. And he's an idealist. And what happens in the film, which he's set in Manchester, <laughs> is that all of the workers and the unions hate him because they think he'll get rid of jobs because once all the, everyone's got a set of clothes, they won't need any more fabric and textiles. So they all hate him and they try and destroy the invention. And all the bosses hate him too for the exactly the same reason, which is that they won't have any profits once they've sold the clothes that are everlasting to everyone. So they want to suppress the invention. And he can't understand it. He's like, I've, I've developed something brilliant for the world. It's gonna make the world a better place. Why does everyone hate me? And it's because consumerism is the engine of the economy and unashamedly so. And obsolescence is what makes consumerism work. Things have to break, they have to be stained. They have to, they have to go away from you in your life for one reason or another in order for you to buy something new and that creates jobs and that creates wealth. And it works. I mean, we know, the reason we have all this wealth today, we're all, got devices and washing machines and hair dryers and phones and as many clothes as you want is because of consumerism. There's just absolutely no doubt about that. And the, and the obsolescence, has it, we're so used to it now, we, we don't even blink when we see it. But it's all around us. So the, the original you know, obsolescence, that, that's technical obsolescence, designed obsolescence, is the original Phoebus cartel who designed light bulbs. So all the light bulb manufacturers in Europe and America got together and said, we're gonna limit the, the lifetime of light bulbs so people have to buy more. We're not gonna make an everlasting light bulb. We're not even gonna make it as a design choice because we know that in order for us to be wealthy and the society to be wealthy, that light bulbs need to last only a certain amount of time. And that's, you know, you can look that up and that, that they, they were eventually kind of discovered. Um, and we do have laws against that kind of obsolescence, but actually they're very weak. Uh, we have psychological obsolescence, which is, at the moment, one of the major types of obsolescence, and it's driven by advertising and marketing, and it's the original, like, if you want to feel good in society, feel high status in society, or to feel like you're part of the gang that you want to be part of, you have to have the shoes, the clothes, the devices, the everything that th that club of people have, and that is constantly being changed. And that is, of course, on purpose, in order to drive you to buy more, and then to keep consumerism going. Um, and you have something called systemic obsolescence, which is where um, manufacturers, um, they basically kind of keep changing something about the system so that your device or thing is no longer able to survive. So it's working perfectly except for one thing, but that thing no longer exists anymore. And so you have to buy a new one. So this is in, in software obsolescence is a good example. Um, Apple are being sued and have just settled in the court for on purposely um, dialing down the battery life of older iPhones um, in order to make you buy a new one via a software upgrade. So it happens all the time. 
um, and it's part of our lives, and we kind of just take it. Because <laughs> at some level, I think we like it, and we have to take responsibility for the fact that we are consumers, right? We, we actually, who doesn't like a new thing? I mean, if you can afford it, I guess that's the issue. But if you can afford it, it you know, there's a massive adrenaline rush, right? Um, so there's the consumerism consensus that's 100 years old, pretty much to the day which is that the role of citizen society is to consume products, and that drives the economy, makes jobs, makes everyone wealthy. Governments refer to us as consumers because we are, that's how the economy works. And consumer societies are very rich. And in fact, that's the mode that all, in the end, everyone's gone down. Even communist societies have turned to con capitalist consumerism to drive growth, and we are still doing it. So this, going from this, look, look at their attire, look at their bare essentials, but that's a normal family in the early 20th century. This is a normal family in the early 21st century. That, that has been, that's consumerism. And that's got to be a good thing. So that means that fast fashion is good for the economy. So Shine, which is the latest in the incarnation of fast fashion, which actually uses AI to scan Instagram and um, TikTok for fashions, and then will, within three days, design something that has been highly liked on those sites. And then we'll start selling it to you within two weeks and you can receive it. And these things cost $8.99 or $6.99 for a dress or an outfit for your kids, a pair of boots. Incredible, what an achievement. We are amazing. Um, and we know this drives the economy. And so what that means is, of course, you have to get rid of stuff. Um, so an individual decision to buy the t-shirts, Scooby-Doo, is a good thing and it will become waste almost inevitably because you'll have to buy something else and you haven't only got a finite room in your house or cupboard or room. So you have to produce waste. And so in, in a way, waste is also what drives the economy. If they don't become waste, you, you can't buy more stuff. This is why disposable cups are a good thing because you know, if you have a reusable cup, you don't need to keep buying cups. But if you have a disposable cup, you've got to buy one every day or maybe two every day. Um, and of course, that produces waste. But then, of course, then we start to think, start to get slightly guilty about the fact that this is bad. This is happening. Like these things fly in the wind or they go out of bins. And maybe, maybe someone isn't actually thinking about how to remake this into a plastic, uh, into something. And so maybe that's a bad thing. And, and this is this change of consciousness about consumerism is relatively recent. And I'll, I'll admit myself, I really didn't give this a second thought until about 20 years ago. I was so into materials and making them and loving them and making new ones. I really had no awareness. And, it, and of course, many, many people have only recently cottoned on to the fact that we've been making waste and hiding it away for quite a long time. But the thing is, it's only the ones that float that you see in the case of plastic. Loads of the plastic sinks. It's on the bottom of the rivers and, and, the, and the seas. You just can't see it. And if all of it sank, I bet we wouldn't be so worried about it. Um, fast tech is good for the economy. And we've just seen a terrible thing where the government has banned this. For goodness sake, what are they doing? This is consumers at its best. You know, a new product with loads of stuff in it lasts only a very short time. So you have to buy a new one, even though all of this is reusable. Brilliant bit of, of driving the economy. What, what is the Conservative government doing? Do they really understand consumerism? Why have they suddenly started to time ban these things? Well, of course, you know, they are rightly worried about the fact that we are the second biggest producer of wee waste per person in the world. So we all, all of us <laughs> produce 23.9 grams, kilograms of waste. That's a lot of stuff every year. They're so buying new phones, buying new hair dryers, buying new toasters, buying new kettles. And weirdly, why do we keep buying the same thing? Because you still only want to boil the water. What? Oh, I know, because it's designed to break. That's right. And we're totally fine with that because then we get a new kettle which slightly matches our new kitchen and, or a new toaster that looks shiny. And we didn't, we didn't clean the other toaster anyway. Had loads of crumbs in it. Great, I've got a new one. It's only $9.99. So that's what we're doing. And um, uh, globally, 53.9 million tons of e-waste which is an enormous amount. Um, okay, so, what, so to conclude, we make materials, they make us. We love them, they're fantastic. They've made us who we are. By consuming lots of them, we've driven the economy and become very materially wealthy. 
and we've made this enormous piles of waste, which are an intrinsic part of that system. And the only problem is that it's degrading the environment to such an extent that it's starting to affect our health, the health of the biodiversity, and pollute everything on the planet. So there is this sense of the albatross being shot by us in a kind of very unthinking way. Just for our own gratification, we've made this system that makes us wealthy, but it actually degrades everything else in the world. So, you know, we're clever. Let's do something about it. Um, and at this point, what I need to do is tell you a little bit about how materials work. And this is, I'm going to, please forgive me, material scientists in the room. This is just like so material science 101 that you're going to get bored. But there are lots of people in the room who don't, who don't live their life designing new materials and thinking about materials. I just want to give you a quick how they work because it's really important for the next bit. Okay. So materials look like just sort of shiny bits of stuff, right? That's a metal and they all look the same as shiny. And that's a bit of a plastic and that's transparent. And there's some like perhaps you can add colors to them. And but actually the inside the outside is 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 it doesn't tell you that the inside of material is incredibly complex. And it's incredibly complex just like the inside of you is incredibly complex. So I want to compare the living world and how it, how it has these different layers of complexity with the material world, just to explain and give you an insight into what material scientists have been doing, creating all these new materials, and why they all give us all these new devices and uh, uh, capabilities like flying and driving and talking on the phone. So I'll start with the living side of the world, just to kind of, because it's actually people are very familiar with these different structural scales. So big things like trees, and then smaller things like whales, smaller things like mice, smaller things like fleas, and the hairs on the flea. If you zoom in further, you find that there are that these hairs are made of multicellular components, and actually we or everything is like a sort of tissue type: our brains, our skin, our lips, our teeth. And actually, what's amazing is that they they all start from a single cell. So single cells, we all start from a single cell, and Single cells develop into tissues, and, and by doing that, they, create, they excrete all sorts of different materials and, and become all sorts of different types of cell type. And so you have something as soft as skin, which has come from the same cell, a stem cell, as, as your tooth, which is hard and ceramic-like, as your hair, which is kind of long and kind of spiky. And, or well, not in my case, but um, <laughs> that's a really amazing thing. So the cell is the Lego of the material of the, of the living world. And it can make all these different things. If you zoom in further, you'll find that inside a cell is like a little city. And, it, and individual cells are incredibly complex, made of lots of macromolecules, as an example of one, millions of atoms big, and, and proteins and lipids and all sorts of things. And here's the miracle bit. They're all going about doing their business, making that cell into, let's say, a bit of enamel on your tooth. Or it's making that cell into a, into a new skin cell because you just had a shower. And it's like, oh, wow, they just washed off all the dead stuff. I better make some new. And it's doing all that, and no one is telling any of those molecules what to do. There's no one in that cell, and you have a trillion of them, going, okay, you go to the edge. You're a lipid membrane. We need that. All right, you you guard that. Don't let any viruses in. It's got, it's got all these mechanisms for, 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 for generating energy, generating material, um, stopping viruses. It's got all that in it, and no one is telling it what to do. This is total self-organization. A miracle, a miracle. That is, um, and it's just, you know, this is marvelous. But it isn't just happening at the scale. Actually, every scale is self-organizing. And they all talk to each other. And at the bottom down here, I've got DNA. So DNA codes for, this, for these molecules. The molecules self-organize to make these cells. Cells self-organize to make the tissues. The tissues self-organize to make all the different organs in your body. And then you, me, we're, we're homeostatic, right? So we, every day... Our whole system is talking to each other at different, scale, different scales and saying, OK, what do we need to do today to keep this entity alive? All right, we need to make some more blood. We need to make some more skin. Off you go. You do that. And so you've got different structural scales saying, hey, there's a cut over here. Quick. Cut, you know. And so we're living, breathing information, but it's, it's, it's distributed. So a living material, we don't really know what it means to say something's alive yet. We don't really know what the kind of thing is. But most likely, it's something to do with a self-organizing system in which it's multi-scale and that there is, there, is, there is interaction between the scales. And so the fact that you and I can fall in love 
we can swim, we can breathe, is because we're a multi-scale entity that is self-organizing. Okay. Now it turns out that you can do that with materials that are not alive. And that's what we've been doing for the last 100,000 years when we make all these new materials. If you want to make something very strong or you want to make something very supple and, and elastic, you just like, just like with a lemur, you have to control the different scales. So when a blacksmith is hitting a piece of metal in some recreation or some sort of fantasy film and making the strongest sword ever, it's not just they're shaping it to a very fine edge. Every hit of the hammer is changing some of the, the, of the crystal structure down here. And they know what they're doing. They can actually feel it in their, ham, in their hands. And, so, and they're also alloying it. They're also exposing different bits of it to oxygen, which is then uh, oxidizing some of the carbon in it and so on. So, but that was kind of, that was sort of, you had a hammer and you had a forge. As, as things go on forward and you go and visit Mike's Futures Labs, you'll see that we have these amazing abilities to manipulate different scales. And in doing so, we've created this wonderful canopy of different materials. So we can now make jet engine alloys, which I did for my PhD, that operate at above their melting point. And that's the point. They would melt if not for the design of the engine. And, and that's why flying is so incredible. Like That's why we can get around the place, because we have these jet engines. Um, we've made these amazing cars, these phones, you know, and by manipulating all these different scales. So when you look at materials, you have to remember they're just as complex as us. And they've got what we've got very, very good at is doing what nature did for four billion years, which is m engineering the micro scale, the nano scale, the atomic scale to create all these amazing stuff, which we then throw away. But that is intentional, as we said. Now, then, okay, we don't want to throw them away anymore. We want to deal with the waste because it's ruining the environment. So we have a thing called a circular economy for those materials. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh -huh. So what is a circular economy? Well, in the past, what we did is, you know, turn of the century and every time we dug things out of the ground, we made amazing cars, radios, washing machines, toasters, boots, and then we threw them in the hole in the ground and that drove consumerism. And that was great. But now we've realized, of course, it's actually, you know, 45% of CO2 emissions. <laughs> Uh, at the last count and huge amount of pollution. So bad. So let's not do that anymore is the idea. Let's in fact never throw something away. When you're, we still need to get rid of something, what we're going to do is we're going to either recycle it back into here so we don't need to mine anymore because we're going to have a, a whole set of stuff that coming in that way, or we're going to re reuse, or we're going to maintain it and repair it. So these loops, these are called circular loops. This is what's going to rescue consumerism because we're not going to be doing this anymore that's the theory but let's just remember that where we got all these products from how do we did it we did it by manipulating different structural scales very 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 expertly but in doing that we've created these very complex materials with lots of different elements um, and that's how you get the properties that's how you get a touch screen that's how you get a silicon transistor, silicon chip. That's how you get a jet engine. That's how you get an electric car. So we, we've done that really well. Um, but then when you look and really start thinking, well, how would the circular economy really work? The reality is that we actually have to organize lots of elements coming in from mines all over the world at the moment with our linear economy. And each one of those mines you know, it has a whole local ecosystem which essentially is being polluted, often the groundwater for some reason, because there's enormous amounts of, you have to mine, you know, for every ton of electrics, uh, copper you get, you have to mine, you know, 100 tons of ore. And so there's an enormous amount of material being uh, displaced, a lot of groundwater being displaced. So you have a big impact. So you don't want to do that anymore. But then you have to realize, okay, but we have got these limited supplies of these materials at, in the current situation, and we'd have to make sure that we can do something about that. Otherwise, we're going to keep digging up the world. So at the moment, or you can see the ones that have, are in, this is the periodic table. These, these are the ones in orange that have some limited apply, supply with the current mining. Um, and we've got some that are risk, rising risk and some which are serious threat. So silver, indium, uh, zinc. And so when you do that horizon scanning and you sort of overlay, those are the elements in your, in your mobile phone. So you have half 
the ones in black circles are in your mobile phones. You have half of the periodic table on your mobile phone. And we've got to make sure that in the circular economy, they all come through the system, right? We can't be digging them up anymore and throwing them away. So we've got to, we've really got to get them out of those incredibly intricate structural scales in some sort of circular way. That's the challenge. Um, and this is the challenge of complexity. We have to design for circularity, but also design for performance. At the moment, we design for performance and manufacturing. So we can manufacture silicon chips, and they are amazing. We can manufacture you know, screens, they're amazing. We can manufacture, you know, put them all together and make a car or a plane. We can do this bit really well, but we can't do this bit very well. We can hardly recycle any of this stuff. And repair, well, let's remember, we on purposely tried to stop repair because we don't want it because it, it stops consumerism. Um, in contrast that with the with living world, we're, where in fact, as, as things evolved on the planet, the recycling of them, biodegradation, evolved at the same time, generally. There were some hiccups, and that's why we have coal and oil. But basically, as new materials were developed, so other organisms learned how to use them to make themselves. So this works pretty well. Obviously, when wood came along and lignin couldn't be degraded at the time, you had a huge deposit of coal, which we're digging up now, and oil as well. But, but mostly it works very well. So, so we have this difference, right? Nature can work out how to do this. And we haven't really spent much time trying to do that because that wasn't our aim in the last 100 years. So just to summarize, um, the recycling bit at the moment, because we're very, very bad at it, we, this is inefficient. And you have very high CO2 emissions if you try and recycle materials. You have to, and you have large losses. And also, let's not forget, you often have to use lots of water and other, other kind of um, stuff which to do it, and that then causes its own pollution. Um, repair, on the other hand, because you got the toaster or the washing machine in your house or the phone, actually, once you've made it, the is actually very low CO2 emissions of pollution to repair it if, if you can get the parts and you have the skill, and it's designed to do that. And that's the sort of key bit here. Where, you have to design for circularity. And at the moment, we've not done that. We've designed for complexity and performance, but we sort of have, we're really going to have to change how we make stuff, right? And if we're also going to have to change the incentive. So we're going to have to say, if you do this, you are going to get high taxes um, because you're going to tax CO2 and pollution. And then we're hoping that's going to shift investment and, to, and try and make these things more doable. OK. So that's consumerism, the recycling route. Basically, the vision would be, let's keep consumerism, ace recycling, just ace it. So we can recycle your shoes, your, your trainers, we can recycle a phone into a phone, and we can recycle your toaster and your washing machine and all the stuff that we can't do at the moment. Um, and that keeps consumerism alive, and that therefore, that's hooray. We've got, we constantly can buy new stuff, everyone's happy, and the economy goes brilliantly. Or Right, we go for the other route, which is we go, we go, no, we can't do that yet. Let's get rid of, let's kill consumerism or let it die naturally because we're going to tax it so highly, the waste, and let's actually big up on the repair reuse economy. So these, these, these are two in play at the moment in terms of a circular route. And they sort of, they sort of oppose each other in a, in a funny way because they kind of, you make much big different decisions depending on what you're going to double down on. Now, at the moment, as I said, there's some tech limits to circular consumerism, which is that we just don't have the tech. We haven't spent the last 100 years basically working out, before we put any product on the market, can you recycle it? Yes or no? No, you can't sell it. No, we haven't done that. We've gone, oh, yeah, just, just put anything you like on the market and with anything in it. And by the way, don't tell us what's in it. It's fine. We'll just put it in a hole in the ground. And then when we can't put it in a hole in the ground, we'll burn it. And then, shit, oh, yeah, that, was, that wasn't very fast thinking, is it? That, that's what we've done. Um, so that's a limit. We've got economic limits on circular consumerism because if you, if you factor in the amount of money we'll have to put to make that recycling work, which is serious amounts of money, billions, hundreds of billions probably, um, to get the net zero transition as well, because there's high CO2 emissions with, with consumption, um, it's going to it's basically going to make things much more expensive so everything's going to be double at least and 
we're already doing it. So the current legislation at the moment, which is on the, which is going to happen, is 2025 EPR is coming on all packaging. So depending, the plastic, cardboard, metal, all of it is going to be subject to taxes to fund the recycling. It seems very far sighted to me from the government. And it's not just, you know, notionally, it's like the local authorities will be given the money from the manufacturers who are paying it, from us who then pay it, and they will be told, now go and fund recycling, develop the technologies to do it. And 2028, which I, so again, so it's, it's coming in a long way ahead. This is a trick. You, you basically pass laws and say, <laughs> we'll be out of office before anyone <laughs> knows about it. In 2028, the emissions trading scheme in the UK, local authorities will have to pay to burn fossil-based plastics, which means that anything at the moment that we're currently burning, if it's a fossil-based plastic, is subject to that tax. And in Manchester, the current estimate is that will cost 15 million pounds a year out of the total waste budget of 165 million. So that's 10% of the waste budget will be a tax on Manchester and all of our consumerism here. So this is happening. Um, but will it be enough to save consumerism? If you look at the repair economy versus computerism, what, what's happened is essentially we've managed to shift repair this way. So we used to sort of repair clothes and we any small devices like cameras that came to our homes, we would repair them. But now these are essentially disposable items. Hair dryers, definitely disposable. Shavers, coasters, kettles, shoes, trainers, vapes, all disposable. So we, we sh we've done this. We haven't, we haven't gone so far as make a car that's disposable yet. But probably we'd like to do that. We would like to do that probably. Like get out of the airport, get into a new car, drive it, and then just sort of crash it or something. I don't know. Someone picks it up. Drive the economy. And um, airplanes, yeah. I mean, God, that's, that's the dream. The dream is to make a disposable airplane. Um, that would be proper capitalism. So... But, but when you look at the cost of ownership, when you're materially wealthy, it sort of doesn't add up because, all right, I've got a disposable phone and basically they're sort of programmed to die after two or three years with loads of different obsolescence tricks like advertising campaigns and not letting you change the battery and all these things. But I still have to replace it with a phone which basically does the same thing. Like at, at some point with technology, it peaks at your utility to you and you're sort of grudging them. I have to buy the same thing again and again and again. Maybe clothes you don't worry so much because you feel good or maybe buying a new hairdryer with a different bit of gold on it. Maybe that makes everyone feel good. But you're still only able to dry your hair. You're still only able to go out <laughs> in the streets and look good. And you're still only, you know. So at some point, the ownership of the utility is costing you maybe more with a disposal option than it is for a repairable option. That's definitely true for a car and a plane, but you know these are these are kind of what what you're trying to weigh up. So the cost of ownership of the utility, can you do it? You know, should actually favour repair reuse. Like if I can keep my phone going for ten years, I pay less for the, the utility of having a smartphone. But actually, it doesn't work out that way, and that's because you know it's just designed obsolescence. So we could we could shift that if we wanted to. We can shift that that way. Societally, um, and, and one of the ways we're trying to shift it is, is this thing called right to repair. Now, right to repair is a law, it's in the UK, it's been driven by the EU mostly, but it's coming into America too now, each different state, the, fed, the federal government, Biden's into it. And, and it's coming from this groundswell of absolute disgust, not so much as, as consumerism, but the fact that we're, we're, we're losing control of the stuff that we think we bought. And this has come to the head with the tractors in America, John Deere, who, you know, being a farmer and having a tractor, those things go together. And, 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 and being, being able to repair it on the farm, this is sort of something that farmers have always been able to do. The, the two technologies have evolved together, the repairability of tractors and, and farming. And all of a sudden, John Deere came along and said, you can't open the bonnet. If you want to change anything in there, you have to come to a dealership. And uh, it got away with it for a few years until a few more farmers had to buy a new tractor and they were like, no way. Like it's 400 miles to the latest dealership in the Midwest. I am not driving there in a tractor just so you can do something I should be able to do. So there's been a big pushback on that and they in fact have lost that battle now, John Deere. Um, 
In the UK, we have right to repair rules that cover things like fridges. Now you have to, you have the manufacturers have to have spare parts available to repairers for ten years. Um, things that have been excluded from that bafflingly are phones, or maybe not bafflingly, depending on who you think has influenced that piece of legislation. Um, but things like washing machines are in this, um, and and the idea is to say we're going to sort of we're moving that repair thing away from disposability and towards and towards repairability. And so there's there's politics coming into play and laws. Um, there's this other thing that's happening, which is like, well, maybe you shouldn't own things anyway, right? Maybe what we'll know it, we won't own a car again. Maybe what we want you to do is just rent it, and that way. That way, all of the waste, and therefore having to do something about it, falls on the, on the manufacturer and owner of that car. And maybe that would drive a more circular economy. And there's, there's a big swathe of opinion that rental is the future. You won't own your phone. You won't own your washing machine. You'll just pay per wash, right? You don't have to worry about repairing it. If you can't, it doesn't work anymore. You just phone up whoever you're renting your washing machine from, and they have to sort it out. And you have some contract where they have to do it in 12 hours or whatever. Similarly with a car or any of these things. Now, the way it is being pushed by industry is that increasingly lots of software is, is, is needed for diagnostics of repair, and they won't actually let owners have it. So it feels like there's this tension now between the manufacturing paradigm of complex objects like cars and phones and indeed washing machines uh, with this rental versus ownership thing, and whether, that, whether that's good for circularity versus yeah, repair and in generally in, in the environment in general. Um, reuse, if, of course, is kind of in a way that even better. So why have all these millions of cables? Why don't we just agree standards for the cables? And that's where governments come in place. And the EU have just mandated that USB-C has to be for all phones because otherwise, you know, otherwise what happens is the phone manufacturers keep changing the cable type every time you get a new phone, you have to keep buying new cables. Um, Apple, who are the main kind of opposers of this, because they weren't using USB-C, um, were furious, and they have a point. They say, you're going to stunt innovation. Basically, as soon as big government gets involved and says, you've got to use this, that's legal, then basically these cables will never get any better. They'll never change. You know, We still have a three-pin plug in this country, right, that is clunky and boring and probably way over-engineered for what it is. But... It's in law, so we ain't going to get rid of it. And they think this is going to be the same. And they have a point, right? So you can see why laws will stop innovation, perhaps. And maybe we are a very innovative culture. Do we really want that? So consumerism drives innovation. That seems really obvious. And therefore, anti-consumerism drives stagnation. Um, and then there's social limits to the circular consumerism. So. I, you know, words matter. People are called consumers. We've grown up being called consumers. When you hear economists talk, they don't talk about people, citizens. They talk about consumers. Um, when you talk about, when you go and talk to companies, they talk routinely about consumers. Your role in life is to consume. We already agreed that's why we're all wealthy. So we shouldn't disregard that as a, as a bad thing to be. But but now, when consumerism is associated with um, environmental laying waste to the oceans and the and the land and the microplastics and you know, we've all started to start feeling a bit queasy about it. And there's definitely a younger set of people who don't want to be called consumers. And, and there is a groundswell against the idea that that's your only role in life, to consume the planet. Because that, yeah, that doesn't seem right and isn't commensurate with sustainability. And, and indeed, in Manchester, you've got a fantastic example of, of the reuse, a uh, renew. Uh, you've got a reuse hub, which is probably the best in the country. Um, and it is about trying to support a reuse economy. So look at all those <laughs> children's toys and, and you know, um, dolls' houses, which, you know, your kids need for one year. Do you need to throw it in the bin? Does it need to become landfill or incinerated into, into pollution? Wouldn't it be better if someone else, some other kid had it? I mean, that seems totally normal. Like, there are some issues about cleanliness, perhaps, but why, why, don't, why don't we do this more often? Answer, it doesn't drive the economy. Idiot. We'll all lose our jobs and get poorer. But Manchester's bucking the trend. Um, but now people are starting to think, well, hold on a minute. But when we say get wealthier, what do we really mean? And so local charity shops have been started puzzling about this. And they've started to understand and quantify social value in the community of being on the high street and reselling goods. 
And they reckon they are 75 billion worth of the economy in 2022. And what they mean by social value, they mean, and you can see the list, there's an Excel spreadsheet of it. They mean things like there was a person to person contact in the shop and that lonely person didn't feel as lonely. There's a price. That person uh, bought a book and that book um, made them feel happier. There's a price for that. Uh, that person got a laptop and they then got online for the first time and they were able to bank and because their local bank is closed. And so there is social value in the reuse economy, which people are starting to quantify in a way to say the only wealth is not just GDP. Um, and so, you know, these are all these things are happening in parallel. So good. Yes. On time, right? So, so then, um, set the scene. I've set the kind of different futures. One is we continue with consumerism, but we just ace the recycling. But honestly, that's ten to twenty years away at best. And so we got, we could just carry on for ten to twenty years. It's probably the most likely outcome. I'll agree with you, but we can discuss that later. Or we can really go hard down on reuse and re and um, and repair. But that mean and, and social value, but that means changing quite a lot about how we live and what we value. And that that may be even harder than developing the tech of recycling. Like we're very good at developing tech. We have all the instruments to do it. We have the brilliant minds like my old team here. So which way will we go? There's just one other thing we have to talk about when we're thinking about those different options, in my view, and that is that. Whenever anyone starts to talk about sustainability and get into material side of things and waste, um, and especially I, I know this from my own work because I had no idea about this <laughs> um, until about five years ago, is that you have to go and look at what the waste processors do and you have to talk to them and see what equipment they've got for recycling and for collecting and all these things. And, and realize that actually, in order to actually win on any kind of environmental um, uh, innovation. You have to understand that basically materials have to go through a system. They have to be manufactured into products. They have to be delivered in some way to you. You have to use them for a while. Then, then you're going to what? have them picked up or put them in the wee waste battery or, or dump them somewhere. They're going to be picked up by someone and they're going to go back into the system again. And you have to look at that whole system. So you can't do circular economy unless you do systems analysis of what the circularity in this country and other countries looks like. And I just, we've been doing a lot of this work and I just want to showcase two of our projects because it just, it really gives you an insight into how hard this is going to be to actually go circular, but also how fascinating it's going to be. So compostable cups, right? Good or bad? Most people in the country think they're good. Actually, most people have no idea what compostable means, but so then they say biodegradable and they go, oh yeah, that's definitely good. Okay, but then when you look at the actual, what is the system of compostable cups coming into people's lives and, and having a coffee in them? Well, they come from biomass, but when you actually look at the suppliers, you find that it's often in China actually, and, and, the, and, the, and the fuel used to make, do the processing is coal. So they're very high, when you do, the, when you do an LCA, life cycle analysis, you find the manufacturing of these materials is very, very high CO2 emissions. You make a biodegradable polymer and you want to make sure if you're a good, and there are lots of very good companies out there who want, they want to certify that it really will biodegrade. So they do a lab certification and they exist. The problem is that they do not in any way represent what actually happens in the real world. So the lab certification is not actually a very good predictor of whether they will biodegrade if they were to get into the environment. Almost, there's almost no correlation. The other thing is they don't have any, they don't have to disclose their additives. So a lot of these materials are hydrophobic, so they resist water. But if you ask them what they're putting into them, the brands won't tell you because they often don't know. They'll just say the manufacturers delivered it to them. And the manufacturer is often using something quite bad for the environment, but they're just not telling you. So, so you have this label, good, but then there's all sorts of weird stuff here. Then it turns out that we are, in fact, going to tax them for making this packaging. And because it's not very um, easy to process at the end of life, it's going to have this extended producer responsibility tax. So it's going to cost more to the user. And then we're going to put it into use. Well, it turns out that people don't really know where to put it. 
at the end of this. They sort of feel like you should put it in recycling, but that will just that just ruins the recycling because these are not often recyclable things, and we don't have the we don't have the ways of recycling. The only the only real way out of the home that that makes any sense is to put it in the food waste. So they maybe they put it in the food waste, but then it turns out the local authorities don't accept it in the food waste. Most of them. And why is that? Well, because actually they're not going to send it to composting. They're going to send it to AD to make biogas, and that means they're just going to take anything in the food that's plastic or packaging. They just remove, they depackage, and they burn. So you did this thing, you thought it was good, but it had all these issues, and now it's burnt, which is annoying. Occasionally, maybe five, ten percent goes through composting, and then it will create some very low price soil nutrients, which will go back on the land. But the problem with that is we haven't really worked out how to deal with microplastics coming out of that system. And if they're microplastics or biodegradable materials, it could be bad. We're not sure how bad. And there's just lots of regulation here about where that's come from, if it's been, if it's been um, part of anything that has got pharmaceuticals or anything. So it's a complicated picture, right? Most of our food waste actually goes through this route where it gets depackaged goes into digestate, anaerobic digestion, and becomes biogas. And that is now part of the net zero target to this country. So we're never going to get rid of this because they're locked in to our net zero goals. In fact, we're bigging up on this. So composting actually is probably going to become a minority, most likely in this country, because net zero is going to drive biogas. So compostable cups, it seems like a good idea. But the reality is that it's not an environmentally good solution. It just isn't. It maybe could be, and that was a big part of our work, which is if you could sort these things out, if you didn't use coal to make them, in fact, if you made them in this country, why would you make them in this country? Well, maybe we're going to make them optimized for enzyme recycling. Um, and I know there's a big activity here in, in, um, in Manchester, which is where you take, a, you take a molecule and you use that to do the recycling. Like It's like brewing. Like imagine a brewery, but it's now a recycling. Big vats of liquid with packaging in them, and you've got enzymes in there are pulling the, the, the polymer apart into monomers. So then we, we optimize it for that. It goes into your home. You put it into the food waste. It goes. It gets collected. The local authorities are all set up for this because that's what we've decided to do. They come along here. They depackage, but this time it goes into the enzyme recycling route. You get it back. You get the carbon back. You're not outputting it into the thing, and you have a circular economy. But you're doing all that for coffee cups. You're doing that just so we don't have to have a reusable cup. So these are the two options. Reuse is quite simple. Re recycling, very complicated. Doesn't exist yet, that, that process. Um, OK, and then another project I want to do. Oh, I've, I've been ignoring you. Sorry. OK, so quick, I'm almost there, though. Um, another project is called the Big Repair Project. And this is where we've been looking at things like mobile phones, electronics and looking at their system. And their system's a different system because actually you, they're made internationally. So you have to really think globally about if you really want to make them more repairable, you have to deal with international trade policy, international property law. You have to look at standards. Um, and then when they come into this country, repair is essentially local. So repair will drive jobs, local high paid jobs in Manchester or anywhere else. So a big repair culture drives a lot of jobs a reduction in CO2 emissions, a reduction in pollution. But it's more expensive than the global supply chain. So this is more expensive in terms of cost to the user, but maybe has more social value because of the jobs and because of the lack of waste. So it all depends on the tax regime. So local global is this tension. Who gains out of the move away from consumerism is the local. That, that's really clear. I haven't, I'm sorry, I've jumped, I've sort of skipped over a bit because I'm running out of time. But, but our, our conclusion is that, that, that when you look at the kind of weighing up where we should go as a society, the hollowing out of the local economies is something that repair and reuse will address in a way that recycling consumerism may be less so. Um, and if you want to get involved in this project, it's called the Big Repair Project, where we're kind of mapping people's ability to repair. It's a citizen science aspect of it as well. And you can look us up, Big Repair Project. And what we're doing is having a look at what people's expectation of repair are of their goods and then what the reality is. So just to give you one example, when we ask people, how long do you expect home appliance to last? 
for small ones like toasters and kettles, they think five years, and for and for bigger ones like like um, you know Hoovers and 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 uh, washing machines, they think ten years. Now, ten years seems to me small for a washing machine, if you ask me. Five years seems like a, a reasonable thing for a toaster or a kettle to work, but they don't. Now, one of the one of the things that comes out of this work is we talk to policy people all the time. We say to them, we'd like to model a policy intervention. What if UK law, everything had to have a five-year warranty? So it has to meet this by law. Would the brands hate this? Would it, how much would it increase costs? But it would, and would it really decrease the amount of we waste and pollution and CO2 emissions? So those are the kind of questions we're asking in this citizen science project. And if you want to get involved, please do sign up. And we don't have conclusions yet. Uh, just telling you that, that you know this is all part of the kind of trying to work out whether a consumerist recycling economy versus a repair reuse economy, which one is kind of the one we should spend more time on as a society. So, uh, my last but one slide, that is, you know, could the death of consumerism be popular? Well, it seems unlikely, right? We all love making stuff, buying stuff. So. You're looking for a tipping point towards repair reuse if that's the alternative, which seems to be the only one around. And if that was true, what does repair reuse have to be? It has to be more convenient, right? Which is a problem with coffee cups. It has to be better for nature. Well, you can put, put pretty sure it is actually. It has to be less waste. Well, it definitely is that. It has to be more freedom. Hmm. Probably not that at the moment. It's got to be more social value. Could be that, could be that, but we'd have to also agree that we want that. It could be lower cost, but it's not now, no way. Repair is almost always more expensive. And it's got to be more fun because really consumerism, we don't want to get down on everyone. Like if you're going to give someone an alternative, it's got to be great. You've got to win, 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 win. Otherwise you won't change. We won't change. And I think it can be more fun. And I think we just haven't, this is about imagination. This is about us as a society going, let's imagine a different sustainable future, one that is repair reuse, and let's make it great. So, conclusions. Advanced low polluting recycling technology is needed to rescue consumerism, but it doesn't currently exist and will take 10 to 20 years minimum. We can debate that. Carbon and pollution taxes are coming in and they will make products increasingly expensive. There's no way around that. And that will reduce consumption because people won't be able to afford them. Um, designing more products for reuse and repair as a more sustainable service to consume is, is an alternative, but there are econo economic, political, societal challenges to growing the repair and reuse economy. We talked about that and I think it's really up for a big debate. Do we want it enough? Probably not at the moment, but when, as we get increasingly desperate, we may decide we do. The word consumer to refer to an economic role of a citizen in a sustainable society is not useful. Like we, we, I think we all agree that we, un, we don't want to be consumers. We don't want to consume the world, right? We need a different word and actually words matter. Um, great, and I just say thank you for listening. Thank you to the whole team. So I work with a whole load of people, different disciplines, and I'm summarizing for all of us. Um, and I, I won't name them all, but yeah, we work together at UCL. And thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to the debate. Uh, so welcome back, everybody. Um, hope lunch was satisfying, uh, but also that you got a chance to, to talk about what you heard, what you thought from your own individual interdisciplinary perspectives. Um, uh, speaking of interdisciplinary perspectives, uh, like to welcome our panel to the stage. Um, so we have uh, three eminent people who can hopefully contextualize what we've just heard from Mark. Um, and uh, so to your left, uh, with the wonderful glasses in competition with Mark's, uh, is uh, Professor Carly McLaughlin, who's Professor of Climate and Energy Policy. Uh, next to her is uh, Dr. Helen Holmes, who's Senior Lecturer in Sociology. Um, who's a particular focus on the materiality of nothing. Uh, and is actually Deputy Director of our Sustainable Futures Platform. And then finally, uh, Professor Maria Shermina, who's Professor of Energy and Sustainability. Um, so if I can start with you, Maria, uh, just to give your thoughts 
give us a, a bit of a sense in terms of where your expertise sits and, and what you do, uh, and give your thoughts on, on what you took away from our stuff. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the very inspiring talk, um, which I think shows how important it is not to make people feel guilty, or not to make them feel only guilty, but also inspire them to actually do something. I found that balance was really good in your talk. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm an economist by background. I was educated, well, I chose education as an economist, and then I repented and uh, <laughs> moved to interdisciplinarity. So I use uh, various methods, qualitative, quantitative, to try and see how uh, business models for circular economy could work, so it's, there's a bit of economics in it, but also um, the softer side of social science. Um, and uh, trying to look at interconnections, really. So I work quite a bit on net zero or carbon emissions, and uh, try to see how circular economy and the net zero agendas might conflict, and um, where they might reinforce each other. So one example was Mark, from your talk, how energy intensive recycling is, emission intensive as well. So, um, and that's something we need to remember. So there are some consequences that are positive and negative. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to pick up on is uh, the cost of everything and how, you know, Mark was saying, that's one of the biggest problems. It's expensive to have a repair economy rather than other types of economies. I wanted to say that you know we're not short of money in this country or other countries in the West. You know we spent uh, 200 billion on quantitative easing in 2009, uh, which means simply printing money. And uh, by <coughs> about mid 2023, we printed 900 billion. So that was the quantitative easing. By then, thank you know, due to COVID, various crises. So good reasons for that. But essentially. We can do it, you know. There's money. It's just about prioritizing. So, um, it, so it's not like we're short of resources, but we are short of maybe right priorities. And uh, so, I think that's um, one message of hope that I'd like to start with from the economics side. Mark's taking notes. I don't know what that means, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a chance to talk after you feel. Uh, uh, feel through all three of our speakers. Uh, so if we go to Helen next, um, give us a bit of background on, you, on who you are and what you're about. So I'm a sociologist, as Mike said, um, quite a different probably sociologist to the ones you may have met before, if you have met any sociologists, in that I am very interdisciplinary, so my work is focused predominantly on consumption, but also, as Mike mentioned then, on materiality, so that's our engagement with objects and things sorts of relationships we have with stuff. Um, very much focused on the everyday, um, so not sort of the, to you, no one, you might not know who I'm talking about here, about Durkheim, talks about the sacred and the profane, not the sacred, so not the things that we hold, we consider to hold high sentimental value to, more the really everyday stuff, so the chair you're sitting on, the cups you're drinking out of, your iPhones, your trainers, those sort of things that we use all the time. Um, part of that work is focused on thinking about <coughs> different forms of diverse economy. So Mark mentioned uh, the circular economy. I also do some work on the sharing economy and um, other sorts of informal economies. And I think that really struck me um, as I'm sort of the people person today. Um, I think it's really important for us to, when we're thinking about a lot of what you've said there, to think actually about how people engage with things. And we know from our work on, um, we have a project called One Bin Through the Mall, which is all about plastic recycling, that people do some really weird stuff with things, things that you never ever expect them to do. That then obviously has an impact on whether they can be repaired, whether they can be reused, and whether they can be recycled. Um, and I think that also comes down to as well, to our engagement with stuff and our need to possess things actually really depends on what those things are too. So I've done all sorts of different work. I did a quite a bizarre project on lost property not long ago. Um, and the, how people have these engagements with things that they, they lost a long time ago, but they can still vividly remember them and talk about them and draw them even. And it's not the stuff you'd expect. So it's things like umbrellas that they might have got from Primark that were two pound, but for some reason or other, that umbrella held some real sentimental value. And it's, I think it's these things that we really need to think about when we're thinking about whether we can get people to engage with repair as well. You know, what are they doing with things? What stuff matters? Because it's not often things that we think people are going to care about that they do care about. 
I think that might be a hook for getting people to engage with repairability. Um, and then my other thought really was around, if we're thinking about repair, it's not just about repair, obviously you mentioned reuse, but there are lots of circulations of stuff that occur and have occurred really for centuries. You know, people do share and circulate things. Um, it's a part of a functioning society, but we seem to have forgotten about, about a lot of that. And we're seeing a resurgence such as like repair cafes or um, food community networks. There is a resurgence in that, those sorts of activities which are going on. And I wonder if it's really about building upon some of that and those sort of slower forms of consumption. And again, being the touchy-feely person here today, I think that's also a thing we need to think about. It's those authentic engagements that we have with things. Why do we care about things? How can we use things to connect with others? And you mentioned that sort of fun aspect before, Mark, and I think that's, that's part of that. And then another sort of point really for me would be around, we really need to think about, and this comes to what Maria's just said, about inequalities as well with this. It's great if we can if we can get people to repair more, get people more engaged with repairing things, but uh, there's probably someone that's gonna lose out there and we need to think about how that would then work across different socio-demographic groupings. And then my final point's really about policy, and I don't think this can just be about um, Zoomers, the dirty word, um, but also about how, when, what more can we do? What can the government do to really drive this as well? Um, so we talked about extended producer responsibility. I think that's got to be way more than packaging and way more than repair. I almost think we should be able to send stuff back when it breaks and they either fix it for a fee. So, you know, it really takes the onus off, off us being able to do that. We had a little chat before, didn't we, a few of us, about things that are broken. Um, you know, Maria said a microwave's broken and it's just because the door won't shut, but it's actually working. I recently, my son, who is a bit, he's now 13, so he throws things about everywhere, broke the zip on his school bag and it cost me more to repair that zip than it did to get a new bag. And it, it's, it's, it's those sorts of things, isn't it, and issues that we needed to be thinking about, I think, with this. What I really liked, if you caught it in the middle, <coughs> right? So Helen's next book, to follow up from the New York Times bestseller, Stuff Matters, you said, what stuff matters? <laughs> there you go, great time. Uh, Carly, over to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Carla McLaughlin and I am the director of Tyndall Manchester, which is part of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research uh, here at the University of Manchester. And we work on kind of all aspects of decarbonising, getting emissions down, but also on adaptation and resilience. So we're an interdisciplinary team. Uh, we were set up in 2000 when being a kind of policy relevant interdisciplinary climate change centre was extremely unusual. Uh, there's many more of us around, around the world now, but that focus on kind of policy impact and trying to work with actors who are, who are trying to make a, make a difference and see our work kind of play out. Uh, in real time, still very central to what we what we prioritise. Uh, I personally particularly work on uh, city level and subnational decarbonisation. So whether that's about setting targets or embedding it in everyday decision making for Greater Manchester Combined Authority, for example. And I've got a little side hustle in music decarbonisation. So sometimes I'm talking about uh, tour routes and uh, that kind of thing. But uh, that's fun, but not what I get paid to do most of the time. Um, so uh, what I was one of the sort of points from your uh, great talk mark um, I think the thing that I really honed on was the vision for something different I think there's a sort of tendency amongst people that are really switched on to environmental issues to be like you know the whole system just doesn't really work and we need something completely different and that is a bit terrifying uh, for many for many citizens or consumers because what are you filling in that space so I think it's really important that we talk about what is what is this different future that we talk about mm -hmm. And rather than throwing all capitalism and consumerism out, perhaps uh, thinking more about what type of consumerism and capitalism do we have at the moment and is it too unfettered and actually it could be uh, arranged differently. When we think about things like growth, who is that growth for? Um, is growth in and of itself a good thing if what it does is continue to expand inequalities? Uh, there are places, certainly in Greater Manchester, where people we would like people to be consuming more because at the moment they are living under the poverty line. Um, but when we talk about growth being needed for all regional economies, we're not breaking <coughs> that down enough into who that is for. And I think what we're often creating is kind of these quite frustrated citizens who have been sort of switched on by the big whale full of plastic uh, to the idea that things are not sustainable. Um, but then how are they to do something about that? And I think the point that you raised around the kind of deeply systemic issues that lock people into behaving in particular types of ways because they might have this thing that they want to repair, but there's no way to repair it um, is really important. And it's 
It's important about who pushes out the narrative around individualising environmental problems and are those the people that have most power uh, to do something about the systemic issues uh, around environmental problems. I think the political conceptions of the consumer are really interesting as well. Um, I think often we find in our elected leaders that there are quite simplistic understandings of what makes people tick and it's really important uh, for us as academics to be working with them to explore that more, to provide the evidence for actually that we find, you know, two thirds of the UK population think that climate change is something that needs to be dealt with with uh, a level of urgency. You know, that's maybe not the natural conception if you are walking the tea rooms of Westminster about how important people think that is. So what we actually require is, is leadership in those spaces rather than the idea that everybody's got to be out in the streets saying they must have more repair. I think thinking more about what do people quite like the idea of? What do they object to? What would they not be that bothered if you actually changed it? And rather than always putting it down to, oh, the individuals won't like this with my kind of not particularly social science informed view of what makes people like things and not like things. Um, two more points. Um, the role of incumbent actors, I think, is really important. So I've touched on this already in terms of um, you know, who's, who, who does it suit to talk about these problems in a very individualized way. I think this is true right across climate change sustainability. It's hugely important that we have the incumbent actors, the people that benefit from the current system in the room. They've got a huge amount of resources and expertise. What I personally don't want to see is them setting the pace, direction and shape of change. Um, so we have to make sure that we are giving our political leaders the evidence to be able to challenge those kind of assumptions about the economic models or what would work and what wouldn't. How can we, how can we actually work together to say, we want to, and this is my last point, uh, to unleash the creativity that Mark spoke about so eloquently, um, that actually, we have, have I just turned that off by hitting it? That was quite, that was quite an impressive shot. Did that with a press, <laughs> press, press, press the bottom. Oh, or alternatively, look at that. <laughs> uh, this, one's, this one's on? No. Oh. Press the bottom. Hi there. Yeah. There we go. Back again. There's something about us needing two microphones um, in a circular economy. But anyway, never mind. Um, so yeah, the last the last point is about kind of unleashing creativity. And I think you know, look at all these amazing things we've managed to make and do and create, and all the improvements that that's that that's delivered. We haven't unleashed that with a parameter of make sure that it's also sustainable. So I think there's so much creativity. There is increasingly buy-in from you know, from whether it's the workforce, citizens, consumers to do this, but we have to have the kind of leadership in the right places to, to say that is that is what we want um, and actually unleash that in a slightly different direction to what's happened so far, which I think you were talking about too. Thanks. Uh, so thank you all three of you. Um, uh, Mark, do you want to talk about what you feel or think uh, after that? I think I had quite a lot of um, um, uh, airtime, but I, I, I just something that I kind of um, I didn't put in the talk that I always li like to talk about is what I call the Lego problem, and it's it's quite a simple one because it, it kind of ties together lots of this stuff that you all just <laughs> sort of alluded to, which is we love Lego. I mean, it's a great toy. It's creative. It's fun. It's made of plastic. It's fossil-based plastic. So in a way, and, and and Lego company itself have been trying to move away from the fossil-based plastic. So they did a whole load of work trying to make bio paste biopolymers, and they've recently abandoned it, and they basically have said to the world, those don't meet the, the mechanical property criteria to make them fit together in a pleasing way. <laughs> so they have now abandoned that, and we're all waiting for the next step forward to them. But what it seems to be obvious is that there is enough Lego bricks in the world, we don't need to make any more. So, they need, they, they are prime targets for all the things we're talking about, like a creative way to still make money, still provide every kid who wants it with Lego at a competitive price, still make it out of plastic, but not just keep making more stuff and polluting the world. And I think if we can, if, if someone as big as Lego, and it might happen in the next five years, it'd be really exciting if they said, we are no longer selling a Lego kit than the new Star Wars movie or this, that, and the other. Which, which those of us who've got kids will know you're under huge pressure to buy. You buy it, it costs almost 100 quid. They then make it, if you're lucky, no, they do. <laughs> they love it for about, yeah, that day. Then it just sits on a cupboard getting dusty. Then you sort of, you say, oh, maybe you should take it apart and do it again. And they look at you with dead eyes. 
And then three or four years later, you'd notice the bits of it have fallen off, and now you're, you're worried as a parent, have oh, I still got the box so I can resell it on eBay? You realize you haven't. And then suddenly one day it smashes on the floor, and you think, oh! And like, what, what we really need, and I, I would love Lego to pitch, is, okay, we're going to have a, re <coughs> a, a Lego box at, in every city, like Manchester, and you bring your Lego bricks to it, and you, and you, and you tell us what film or fancy character you want to buy, and we'll have a thing that you can make, and you, you put all your Lego bricks into this machine, and it'll print out the ones that you need. I mean, it'll, it'll sort the ones you need, and print out the instructions for making that new thing, and I'll pay money for that. I, as a parent, I'll pay 10 quid or 15 quid for that moment, knowing that I can go back the next month and get a totally different thing, and no more bricks have to be made. That's a Soto kind of model. It's creative, it's interesting, it's local, it, it, it kind of win-win, but you could, it could work, as I see it. Have you pitched it to them? I have pitched it, not to them, but to, you know, audiences like you. Hoping that someone from Lego will be in it. I can't believe they're not. If they've listened to you, Mark, they've heard it. Because last Christmas, for my mother-in-law, we bought Lego bouquet of flowers. These were Lego flowers. You assembled it in And looking very carefully, the flowers were mostly made out of pterodactyl wings. <laughs> or some, so clearly they're reusing dinosaur wings to make Lego flowers. So there is, there is somewhere in um, Denmark, somebody's had your thought. I mean, I'm so, sure so is, is that a reused pterodactyl wing, or is that an <laughs> <laughs> unsold pterodactyl <laughs> wing? Where there was, because they overestimated the popularity of Jurassic Park. It's reusing the dime. The dyes would have cost so much to, to use, so you're, having, you're, you're reusing the product. Hey, no, yeah. I, I know, yeah. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, so um, uh, chairs, no, we'll get to your questions uh, in a bit. So chairs privilege, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, the first question to our illustrious posse uh, up here. Um, and, and the first is about, uh, sort of to pick up on a, a point that Carly made about who wins. So I, I think one of the reasons why the use of the word consumer uh, is so prevalent is that there actually is a set of individuals who do win, and those are the people who lead our major corporations, right? And so, the while we are all wealthy, some of us are a heck of a lot more wealthy, and there is a, an embedded maintenance of that system in the billionaires, right, who want to keep that system going to maintain their own personal status, which distracts, I think, from the individualization that happens with that word consumer. So how do these proposed changes fit within a model of continued uh, shift towards unfair distribution of wealth? And how do we push back against that? Not that I have any answers to that, but uh, so there is a concept in economics called Pareto efficiency or Pareto optimum, and it's a state where you know whatever change you make, someone will lose. So no changes are possible, uh, really, without making someone a loser in some sense. And uh, I think we it's it's, sort of, it's a fiction actually that we'll get somewhere uh, like circular economy without you know creating losers. Uh, some of them, you know, some people lose in, in big ways, others in small ways. So that's where there's role for government to come in and distribute, redistribute the wealth that's been accumulated. Um, uh, there's always, you know, good examples. Other countries <laughs> do it better uh, than we do often. So, um, you know, for example, Scandinavia. Scandinavia. Uh, so that's one example. Um, Another one is potentially something I wanted to pick up on later on skills, you know, redistributing skills. Uh, Singapore is another example that's often uh, sort of waved around as a, something that you, the UK could do post Brexit. Um, so, in terms of skills, for example, they have a program called um, Future Skills where they give credit to every citizen who's older than 25 and they can use that um, credit, that money, to reskill themselves or to get any education that they want. Well, within uh, that credit, and so that's something that could be done here as well in terms of reskilling. Because I think that's one of the things, Mark, you mentioned. It, 
you know, if you have the skills, then you can repair things. Or if there's someone who owns a repair shop with those skills. And so, so I think that's, that would be one way of doing it, lifelong learning and giving credit to people to try and uh, reskill themselves. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's a thing that um, I wonder about a lot, about sort of extreme wealth and climate action. Um, and I suppose, I don't have an answer to this, but it's a thing that I consider a lot and I would welcome your views on it. Like, do we have to sort that out before we can sort out proper decarbonisation? Like, do we have to stop having so many billionaires before we can sort climate action? Or is there not enough time to do that and you need to build such a coalition of the willing to get to some level of change you kind of don't have time to get everybody to think the same way and think that that level of inequality is unacceptable before we unleash some climate action. And of course, there's a whole load of nuances in between. Um, and I think this probably comes back to the idea of like nuanced understandings of, you know, it doesn't mean that you get rid of any sense of inequality, any sense of rewarding entrepreneurship. But at the moment, do we do we kind of not do that in a way that, that fully fits with our sustainability objectives? Could we move closer to some of the Scandinavian uh, type models to, to try and capture more of that wealth back in for the common good? So I think it's a really I think it's a really complicated question that and one that probably people have quite different views on in the room, I would imagine. I, I think what's quite interesting is like you have government policy, which would pr principally be taxation, or you have uh, the action of a few people to get behind something, right, to be able to make that happen. Uh, so I, I mentioned this to Mark before, I was at a, a conference, uh, which I call the Guilty Billionaires Conference, which is effectively funded by people who feel bad about what they have done to the world. Uh, and then they're gonna go and try and make a difference, but they're trying to make a difference in a very capitalistic way. And it just changes the authenticity in terms of any of those proposed changes. I don't have much to add to really to what has already been said, but just to say that there is research being done on um, consumption by elites. So Alan Ward, uh, who's at Manchester, uh, uh, was at Manchester, um, has been looking into this, and I think maybe that's another way to sort of understand the consum consumption practices. The elite maybe find ways in to tackle those practices, and I think you know we've just said there, Mike, about the, the guilty billionaires. Maybe if one starts, that might be a way in to think about alternatives. I mean, personally, I'm not bothered about the billionaire, honestly. I, 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 so I think I, I, I follow her on the, we don't need to necessarily worry about them too much. That, that would be my approach. I think we need to um, imagine a better future that we can all, and we need to just make it happen with that. Like, what, <coughs> sorry, what's stopping us is, is, um, is not them. It's actually a virus, no. Um, <laughs> 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 I think it, it's not good for us, I think, to think that we don't have the ability within ourselves, I think, to do something about this. That's why I mostly think. Just as an aside about the economics of it, so there's a very rich person who owns a big white goods firm. I'm not going to talk about them. We're involved in working with them. And when we, we two years ago we started talking about repairability of their products and how we thought they were just not they were playing lip service to it and, all that. and they were very 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 front of us now. and then you know over the years we've been carrying you know, doing projects today and carrying on talking to each other so we trust each other within you know with, I think that and and so we're on different sides of, the, of this argument but then they said to us in January it's totally bold us over there like, we've done the calculations about repair versus selling new white goods. And we've discovered something that we hadn't realized before, that the profit we make on every fridge we sell in the UK is £10. The profit we make on a repair of a fridge is £35. And we're like, whoa. So profit repair is more profitable. It's very unusual to come across a business. It's really unusual. So we're like, whoa. So repair is like the obvious way forward. So, and they're like, yeah, so... <laughs> so it's, the question is how do we how do we get customers to like that fact? Like actually, you know, we need to sell repair so we can make more money. <laughs> um, and I'm like, well, you know, if that's how we can get change, I'm for it. You know what I mean? Like, 
if I can get big business and the billionaires to go to repair as, and therefore be sustainable, and they still remain rich, I'm not that bothered. I mean, no, personally, I'm not that bothered. You know what I mean? I, I'd like to use capitalism. Well, and I think the really interesting thing about that is uh, how does that, I don't know, I know who it is, uh, how does that white goods manufacturer change the design of their product to make repair easier because they know that they can make profit? Because that then becomes a margin. So if they make it easier, then it takes less time, and therefore they can make more money off of that repair. That that is the tipping point. It has to be economically sustainable for it to be environmentally sustainable. And uh, actually, uh, we have to think even deeper than that because you know more repairs, creating more money means they might want to make products that break faster. So it's the moral hazard. Um, so what you know there are business models where you. You know, a consumer a user pays for the time when the product does work rather than for the repairs. Mm. So while the product is working, the consumer is paying. When the repairs are there, you know, you have to make them, then the company is paying. So it's a fault that it's not been good enough. So you know you have to think about unintended consequences. Uh, so we're now gonna open the floor up to uh, questions from the audience and the first one was the first one. Now, we've already answered it, so the uh, second one was here. <laughs> if you can uh, just tell us your name and speak up, I'll repeat your question if you need to. Hi, uh, I'm Gaurav. I'm a PhD researcher with the Tindall Center. So uh, thank you, Mark, for the lecture. It was also a learning thing for me how to present complex things very easily in a simple way. So I just wanted to bring a bit of global context to the conversation. So. I am also relating, I was reflecting on the work I do also. So wanted to like, I was thinking with the connection between consumption and material well-being. And we like, they were talk about capitalism. So I just want to take, take it to like, there are societies in the world which kind of lives in the complex of feudalism and capitalism. So maybe some sort of consumerism or incre incre increase of the material well-being or the material things is is better is better from that for them like some of the societies which live in like in really like i want to say like things like poverty elevation programs they concentrate too much on material well-being and consumption reason being that social reform takes time and time is an important element here so like thinking in that complex societies because majority of the waste will be coming from these developing countries so if similar work you have to do, so what factors will you take into consideration for those societies? I mean, if I, if I probably go first, I, what's, our, what's our minimum expectation for how we treat people, right? And I think that fundamentally, we have to get to this state where we care about every life. And that, that minimum, we have to ensure across the world that that's met. I, I think your comment about the easy way to solve that with an influx of material is fascinating because that's actually the, the, how we want to do a switch to repair or a development of recycling technologies or a change in those social constructs. All of those things take more time. And I, I think the challenge is for us to figure out what do we do as we make those longer and harder transitions that is the most, the least damaging to our planet. And that's an exceptionally hard question to answer. But it, I do think today we have focused very much on the UK and our affluence and our privilege um, versus what happens in the rest of the world. And what happens in, uh, rightly, other parts of Manchester, to be fair. We have not fixed this either. Uh, thanks for the question, Gaurav. Uh, I don't have an answer to this one, but uh, I think we can take this question even further. You know, Who gives us the right to say that human life is more precious than life of an animal that dies because we, you know, we mine something? So uh, you know, where where do we draw that line, and how do we stop harming things just because we need to satisfy our needs, even before we start talking about the distinction between the needs and the wants? You know, something that we need to survive as opposed to something we need to I don't know, 
feel better or show off, etc. So where do we draw the line about our rights as human beings to damage the environment? Um, I guess it's sort of ecological absolutism in a way, but it's something we should probably all think about when we make our choices. And um, I think one of the things Mark was saying, you know, we're at the crossroads, uh, we need to decide which way will we go? Circular economy, linear economy, which type of circular economy? I think we are at the crossroads almost like every instant of our life when we're choosing something, buying something, which clothes we put on. Um, it, not that it's, uh, you know, it's not going to make our life any easier, but it's just something that we can all reflect on um, pretty much every day. I mean, the, the one thing, I mean, I, know, I don't know an answer to that question, but I, 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 the global thing, that one thing I feel quite strongly about is that we, we um, in, the, in the wealthy, let's say, West, um, are, we, we are owners of the big corporates who are selling into those countries. And, and most of those countries, um, well, many, many countries um, in the global south, let's say, have no waste infrastructure. And yet we still sell knowing that that is going to end up in the ocean, all of that stuff, we know that. And we, it couldn't be more clear. So it's a different problem in a way than in the West, where we have a waste infrastructure, but then we don't know what to do with the waste. We, we know it's going to pollute in, when we sell drinks, you know, sachets of washing machine, any of that stuff. And we, do we need in the, to put pressure on our own corporates to say, you, you, you can't sell into those countries you can't sell into any country without a waste infrastructure. It, and you have to make a waste infrastructure <laughs> before you can sell into it. And it has to be able to deal with your materials before you can sell. And is, that, is that where we should be? Should we take that stance? Should that be part of the plastic, world plastic, UN plastic treaty? Yeah, but that, there's a consequence to that, in that the sachets then are not being sold in those countries. And you suddenly, like, you know, we shouldn't be at the stage where the democratization of cleanliness is a thing, right? Like, that, that's actually really important. But that EPR is not international, I think, is where this is a problem. So the reinvestment of that money into great effects in the local councils, but how is that being dealt with internationally? And so I think this is about resourcing the circular economy transition. Repair works really well in those yeah, countries as well, by the way. Um, uh, and, and we're generalizing a little. R repair, there's many, many examples of exceptional repair communities uh, internationally. And so it's actually about taking that systems view of what are, what are the examples of best practice we have internationally? How do we incorporate those? Uh, how do we learn from each other to make the system sustainable? Can I pick up on the sachet example <laughs> while we're writing on it? So uh, that's an, uh, there's an example of another unintended consequence when uh, a certain company stopped producing sachets, supplying them to uh, a, a poorer country, and people just couldn't afford buying uh, things that were larger in size. So they were buying that sachet one, once a week because they could afford it, but then they couldn't buy something bigger. So they needed the sachet, they wanted it, because that was cheaper than something larger. It's very complex. Once you start pulling one thread out of this, uh, you know, the whole messy thing comes up. Uh, at the back. Yeah. I, I think you're talking about this, uh, you know, the cycling economy and, and also related to climate change. And we know the climate change needs international agreement and international collaboration. Do you think this circular economy, I know you're based on the UK or not, do you think there's any agreement internationally on how these certain economies should operate? Uh, so if I just repeat that for people who couldn't hear. Uh, so what are, are there going to be any international agreements or collaboration on the way forward as we have for climate change? Not not regarding whether or not those national international agreements work on climate change. I, I, I mean, I, I think there is sort of inklings, I mean, I mean not that I know of in a, any kind of, it seems to me that the EU have been leading the way, um, and that is quite um, remarkable. They have actually pushed it really hard, and, and the UK have sort of followed along, um, because they were in the EU, and, um, 
I need to harmonize some of the uh, border arrangements. Um, and I, I don't know if there's much going on in the circular economy. Uh, I mean, the US is, is way behind, um, um, as I see it. And there's, there's a bit going on. Um, there's certainly lots of activism, but I think there's a real reluctance to kind of use um, legislation. And I think this is systems, you know, one of the things I sort of, it's, the penny has dropped for me looking at systems is that um, systems are, have to be maintained by the state. Like systems are, are, are that's basically one of the state's roles is to make a system work, and then and then and then businesses can operate within the system. And uh, when I say a system, I mean not just the the, the kind of infrastructure, roads, rail, and the, and the waste infrastructure. I also mean the laws around it and, and compliance and safety issues. And I think um, I haven't seen. I, mean, I don't know if anyone else has a, 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 a big concentration of those sort of laws in other countries, except for the EU and the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rob from Co-op. Um, I was uh, interested in the work um, that Helen and you were doing on disposal anxiety and um, how getting people to <coughs> hold objects that they already own might be a way to unlock the circular economy. So I was wondering what do the panel think about um, how we're going to see more of that and what do you think brands need to do to get people to hold the objects that they already own? So just to reiterate, so what can brands do to get people to love the objects they already own? It's a nice sentiment. So I think that's a great question. Um, I think from the work that I've done, it's not necessarily about the, always about the object itself, it's more about the associations of that object and who or what or when it reminds people of. Um, but also there's a lot of work done on um, the best way I can describe it is it's a really comfy pair of jeans that we've probably all got or a really comfy pair of shoes that you know gets a hole in you're like well, what am I going to do now about that because I really like those jeans and I can't find any that, that fit just, just as well so often it's, it's, it's quite um, intangible sort of associations that people have with things um, and obviously we've seen changes haven't we we've definitely seen changes I think towards people not necessarily just throwing things away but thinking more about what they can do with things can it be repaired um, if for some reason they can't use something now, you know, there are lots of options for sort of sharing or circulating those items, such, you know, so I know you mentioned Vinted before on one of the slides, didn't you, which seems to have a, a massive growth. But in terms of what brands can do, I don't know, I think it's more about pushing, you know, loving the things you've already got, being aware that, you know, you, there are places that you can go and get things repaired, um, you know, you can, you can still own that thing for a bit longer. I can't really say any other way to sort of do that, but I think we definitely need more research in that area because I don't really know of anybody else who's sort of looked in depth at why people keep things away in cupboards and broken things in garages just because they can't quite part with it, but they're not sure why, um, to, to really try and understand that a little bit more. And it's not necessarily about the brand. It, there's a whole complex arena of, of uh, associations with those things or that thing is just right for them for whatever reason at that time. I mean, I think co-op has a unique space, right? Because it's not a traditional corporate, right? But if I if I go and I connect Maria's comment on skills to this comment, right? Oh, okay, we want to encourage spaces for people to get those repairs done. Well, that actually, actually is the, the space for corporates to be able, if you have a footprint, to be able to go and set up spaces where those connections are being made. If that is your space, then the emotional connections that are being made, which are tied to the value, are actually tied to the value of your brand as well. And so I actually think there's a lot of value in creating the social fabric that enables repair. But we need more people who can repair, right? And that then comes back to the skills piece where actually with that, it's almost artisanal. We shouldn't have it, being able to fix a microwave door should not be something which is now artisanal, but it is. And we have to have more people who have that skill set and are willing to share that skill set. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things in organizations which I might call the shiny green thing problem, which is you've got like a team of people who work on a very small part of the organization doing good stuff. And we just don't look over there at all the people that are doing all the stuff we always did. So co corporations are amazing at making, making people do what they want them to do. 
you know, there's whole vast marketing teams. So basically you have to do this unleashing of all of that on a transformed business model and not expect like Dave and Janice in the green team to be able to make this work in the face of the multi-billion push from the other side. So I think it's about the centrality of it and being willing to change your business model and having it genuinely from your leadership so that that is what you're held accountable to rather than something where you're just kind of fighting against the tide of your own organisation. So we have five minutes left, so last question right here. Um, I'm Sammy in the IT department. Um, thank you for the talks, brilliant so far. Um, I just wanted to say, on the point of making things so that they're re repairable, there are brands out there like Fairphone, like the mobile phone industry, they design the phone so that it can be repaired by the consumer. Um, and I wonder you know, whether that's possibly the way forward for other brands to take that kind of modular design forward, but also could, as I was talking to Carly before about this, um, could products have multi-uses? So phones already have, if you can, the phone kind of replaces the torch, it replaces the alarm clock, you can, you can, it has multiple uses. Could it also cook your dinner? Could you have uh, airplanes that dry your clothes? I know these are wacky ideas, but <laughs> multi-uses so that you don't end up having to get to that repair stage. It will eventually, but you can extend the use of the products because they have multiple uses. So that I, I, I won't be able to do this question justice by summarizing it, but uh, effectively, can airplanes dry your clothes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the reality is, is you take a, a model like Fairphone where you now have a repairable uh, object, but you also have the object, the phone, replacing an alarm clock, a flashlight, and a whole bunch of other things. So how do we actually think about the importance of multi-device replacement, right, as well as how, how do we ensure that those things can last as long as possible? I mean, I, I have a fair phone, so I know what you're talking about. And I, I, I have a spare battery through which I can change in 10 seconds, so I don't have to worry about my phone dying when I go on a train, because I have a spare battery and like, I find it amazing <laughs> that other people choose to have phones where they're, they aren't, they're not given that liberty. I find it just incredible since this exists on the market. But I think the problem is that you have to then be part of an ecosystem. And the, the issue with that kind of multi-use is, is that when, it, when you take away that object or when you take away that utility, you're, you're destroying quite a lot of different utilities. So I think it is a sort of balance there. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, for instance, for a university, I mean, we're in UCL, we're trying to push towards not giving people a new laptop when they start. And that sounds like a radical thing to do, but a refurbished and repaired one, because actually, you know, really you're just trying to, mostly the laptop is just Word and answering enormous numbers of emails, which a repaired laptop can do. Um, and, you know, we can live within a university, you know, we have an ecosystem within the university, we can actually invent a future that we can trial at a living lab, and and if you look at the wee waste of a university in terms of laptops and phones, it's mm -hmm. massive. Um, so it's in our hands. A very different approach to Manchester, so uh, we timed the uh, obsolescence of our laptops uh, three months before you submit your thesis. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. On that obsolescence of laptops and technologies, you know, when I like show my phone, which is maybe seven years old or so, iPhone, I stopped updating and all that. You know, cybersecurity experts like they just hold it in hand and yeah. they, like hand in their hands because it's such a cyber threat. You know, same with laptops. So really, old laptops are not very secure in that sense. So there are other reasons, and uh, you know, we have to do something about that side as well. Yeah. But I think one of the solutions to, in terms of brand participation and uh, making things um, um, like repair acceptable or even desirable is about making them glamorous partly you know one one example is um, elbow patches on Mike's um, yes. <laughs> jacket it's a fashion statement you know uh, so it's something you can do and one one good example of that is um, you know plus size models in our advertisements. We didn't used to have that, but now it's common. So can we have like patches everywhere on the clothes when we advertise them? Because it's just normal, you know, people repair things, uh, buttons fall off and so on. Uh, 
um, not, not talking about UI specifically. <laughs> <laughs> so just it's about making that uh, acceptable and um, maybe even a, f a fashion statement. You know, like, um, what, what was it called? Oh yeah, Cons uh, ostensible consumption. Um, that was something that was popular in the 1940s, you were saying. But now billionaires actually wear clothes that are fairly, you know, grey and hidden and uh, modest, even though they might cost really quite a lot of money. So the, the, the fashion has moved and we can, we can move it even further, I think. Uh, so we're coming to a close and I guess um, when we're thinking about this, we, we not to not to blame the consumer, right? Not to think about uh, or or suggest this is all down to them. But I think certainly in our interaction with the sustainable futures community, everybody wants uh, to know what they're supposed to do. And so what I'd like to do as as a close is to just think about what you want the audience to do after this. Um, and it could be sing a joyous song or. <laughs> um, what, what do you think that, that we should be doing on the back end of uh, this excellent talk and these excellent talks? I'm going to choose Mark. Okay. To I mean, I think that, um, I, you know, there are lots of things I could say, but I, I would encourage everyone to, to do something creative that is also sustainable. Like, try and push yourself <laughs> into the creative space as well as, so if, if it's going to be a repair or, or going to some, uh, you know, Re reusing something, don't just do it in a kind of, oh, I'm doing good for the planet. Actually kind of celebrate it, talk to other people about it, because the more, the more vibe we get around this, the more it will grow as a thing. And we, we've got to be quite loud if we want to change social habits. Great. Anybody want to go first? Um, I think I'd like you all to Go to the back of your cupboards, go in your garage, and look for all those things that you have been holding on to for a long time because you might just fit back in it, or you might just get it repaired, and have a really good think about what can you do with that, what's the most sustainable thing to do with that thing. Is it to pass it on, give it to somebody else? Is it to go and get it repaired at maybe one of the local repair cafes, the Remini around Manchester? What can you do with that thing rather than hang on to it whilst it sits there gathering dust? And I am just as guilty of this as everybody else. One thing I would say is that sometimes it's challenging to know what the most sustainable thing is. And in that instance, it's great to talk to people about it, right? We have an absolutely diverse and interesting community of researchers here. And so one of the great things you can do is to just talk about those objects and what you want to do with them. You can save the best for last. Um, so, yeah, I, w I would like people to maybe put down their identity as a consumer and think about all the other identities that they have. Uh, whether that's at work or in your community, and think about where do you have control? Like, how can you throw your net out and make some change? But if you join that net up with someone else, where could you start to exert your influence more widely? Um, so, you know, if you work in a department in the university and you look around and things annoy you about the unsustainability of that, how can you build a coalition to say, we're going to start doing that a bit differently and, you know, stretch your net as far as you can? Yeah, my point is going to build on that. Um, I, th I think something that came out very clearly in Mark's presentation is how much power we have as a species to change our environment, to shape it, you know, to make it better or make it worse. And often when we talk about sustainability, you know, people feel powerless as if, you know, they can't do much, they can't change the system. And it's true, you know, we have to change big things like infrastructures. But you still have a lot of power, so I think it's good to remember that uh, power over your, over your own choices. Uh, well, thank you very much for that. So, what we've learned today, you know, so consumerism is going to die, because right, Mark's always right, um, but that, that's really complex, and we have uh, ways to work as individuals, but we also have the power of community, right? And Sustainable Futures is really focused on bringing together those research communities and talking to people who are outside of those communities on how we can all work better. Uh, so uh, I really would encourage you as well to engage in our other events, to come and participate, to seek out opportunities to collaborate uh, within the Sustainable Futures communities and all of the institutes that we work with. Um, and I'd like you to finally join me in thanking Mark, Carly, Helen, Maria uh, for their time today. Thank you.
Finally, thank you to uh, Emily, who's been standing in the back, uh, working her calf muscles extraordinarily. Uh, so uh, the Sustainable Futures Group is really dependent upon a lot of people doing all this hard work to organize it. Uh, we also have to thank uh, Bruntwood for this space. Uh, and so if you've not been here before, it's really a remarkable collection of buildings. Uh, I particularly like the North Brewing uh, uh, place right across the road where Mark and I were last night. Uh, but it's great to be able to come here at this interface between sort of academia and innovation and commercialization to be able to have this lecture. So uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, thanks to Bruntwood. And thanks to all of you for attending.